Yeah, I'm Cheska Colorado Mansfeld. I'm one of the co-founders and the current executive director of Miracle Feet. Uh, we're a small nonprofit that treats children born with club foot in low and middle income countries. But we um, first realized that we needed to develop a brace because we were trying to roll out more countries. And every time we went to a new country, we had to solve the brace problem again. Um, and so the sort of traditional way of uh, working to provide braces in low income countries was to set up a little workshop. And you'd make the leather shoes and you'd get someone you know, to, to make them a little bar in between. And it was just a lot of work to get all the materials there and then to manage the quality. So on top of trying to help support a, a you know flourishing club foot clinic we were also having to do this whole you know medical device piece on the side and it just became um, hard to imagine really scaling our model while we did that so we figured out that we needed to solve the problem and there was also very nice braces that are made in the US where the shoes clip on and off which makes it a lot easier for the parent to put the shoes on the kit so you can put the shoes on and then you can clip them into the brace if you have shoes that are attached to a bar and the kid starts struggling then the whole thing is flipping around and, and hitting the mother in the in the face so so we thought, okay, there's got to be a better way. Um, the braces that are available in the U.S. cost between $360 and $1,000, depending on where and how you buy them, which was obviously prohibitive in the countries that we're working in. So we were very lucky, and we had we knew that Stanford had a program called Design for Extreme Affordability. We approached them, and we said, we you know we would love to work on a project where we try to come up with a design um, to bring the price down, but have the functionality of the braces that are the preferred type of brace in the U.S. Um, so that was really what led us down this path of innovating and realizing that we could actually come up with our own products to solve some of these problems that we were identifying as, as we grew and as we scaled the organization. Um, so the Brace was the first project that we worked on. It's now being used in about half of the programs that we support. People absolutely love it. The parents um, love the fact that the shoes come on, on and off. The providers really like it. It's adjustable. And it was all designed to bring the cost down. So every piece of the design, um, so it, in terms of that it, that it can be used with multiple pairs of shoes. So as the kid grows, you don't have to buy a new bar, et cetera. Um, and we even get requests in the US from parents who'd like to use it because they like the look of it. It's a more child-friendly um, piece of equipment than the very medical looking braces that they tend to get at orthopedic hospitals or through their orthopedic surgeons in the US. Um, but we haven't made it available yet for legal reasons and compliance reasons or the rest of it. Um, so that's the brace. Um, after we designed the brace, um, we were very fortunate and got a grant from Google for about a million dollars um, to work on using technology to um, help improve the lives of disabled people. Um, and so we used that money to revamp our data collection tool. Um, and we were already collecting a lot of information about all the kids that we treated, the full medical record, all their demographic and contact information, as well as photographs of the feet so that we could really track what was going on. But the problem was that the systems we were using were PC-based and they were just very difficult to use in low bandwidth situations, particularly uploading photographs. So with the Google funding, we were able to work with Dimagi um, and, and get, a cust get them to work to develop a customized version of their Comcare platform. Um, and we incorporated feedback from all the other organizations working at Clubfoot. There aren't that many of them, but they, they all provided input. So we developed something that was designed to work for any organization who wants to use this for Clubfoot. And, and other organizations are now coming to us um, and approaching us about using it, which is great, which we're providing for free, like open source. Um, so the, the app um, allows whoever's in the clinic, whether it might, sometimes it's the provider, sometimes it's a parent educator or an assistant, to collect real-time uh, treatment information so that we don't have to have double entry and have people collecting paper records and then going back and entering it into the system, which means it's less time and also much more accurate. Um, and with that information, we can track how an individual child is doing but also how well a particular clinic is doing, even a provider is doing, and certainly how the country is doing. And then we feed that information right back to our partners in the field so that they can see what's happening and they can come to their own conclusions rather than us telling them, oh gosh, a lot of kids are dropping out in the bracing phase, what are you going to do about it? Instead, they can see that data and immediately start to tweak and improve their own program. Um, and we, so we use that for monitoring and evaluation, but it's also a, a tool and a resource for our providers. Um, and they're really seeing it as that and realizing how much power there is in that information. Um, and we're getting much better data and much more timely data, um, which everybody is appreciating. So it's working really well. Well, we're, we're very honored to be part of the network. Um, the piece, I think what we were most excited about was really the networking opportunity with other innovators working in the healthcare space. And there's just so much to learn. Um, 
and other people have solved a lot of the problems that we are also challenged by. And so being able to share best practice, being able to talk to people about how they might have solved a problem, but also how we might work together in particular countries. So, you know, already just in, in today, I've met a number of people that are working in similar markets or are working on similar problems where there's, there's opportunity to collaborate. The other piece of it for us is that we, are, we have been so far a, a purely um, charitable model where you know we have to get grants we have to get money from donors and then we use that money to make sure that children get treated um, as we start moving into middle income countries we recognize that there is more of an opportunity for cost recovery and potentially for some revenue generating opportunities to at least be revenue neutral and because innovations in healthcare organizations could have spanned the, gam the gamut from non-profits to for-profits we think we can also learn about some other models for how we could, in certain markets, tweak what we're doing um, and learn from, from others that are more on the for-profit end. Uh, we're not looking to change our basic model. We will continue to do what we do in, in the really, really low-income countries and in rural settings where asking people to contribute might result in fewer kids getting treated. Um, but we do believe there's an opportunity for some cost recovery uh, in different markets. Our goal is to end clubfoot disability worldwide. We're not going to do that on our own. We're going to do it by partnering with everybody else that's working on this. And there is, there's, a, there's a handful of other organizations that are also in this field. Um, and certainly, it's all about our local partners. But we really think, based on what we've done so far, that it's possible to, to end untreated clubfoot as a problem, um, just as it isn't a problem in the US. Um, and we'll do that really by expanding in the countries that we're in, um, which we've been very successful in doing, and then continuing to enter you know, three or four countries a year um, to build national Clubfoot programs. The great thing about Clubfoot is that once that program is built and really integrated into the public health infrastructure of that country, we do not need to continue to stay there forever and to put funds in. So, so this is kind of an upfront investment to develop the program, get it running really well, and then taper off our involvement and, and the dependence on outside support. Um, we have yet to do that, so that, has, that part of the model has to be proven, but we're seeing a lot of progress in particular areas. Um, so for example, in Tanzania, the government has agreed that they will integrate Ponseti training, club foot treatment training, into the medical schools and into the physical therapy schools. So then we'll be spending less time and effort on training people. Um, in India, the ASHA volunteers um, are reimbursed for identifying any club foot cases and referring them to clinics. So that helps with the early identification and referral. And there are those kinds of things happening across the board. It's not going to be kind of black and white, where one minute it's Miracle Feet and the next it's the government. It's a slow integration and handoff and, and, and um, transfer of responsibility into existing parts of the public health infrastructure without really adding a lot of additional cost. So that's my goal is that we're going to, well, our goal would be that, that there would be no more untreated clubfoot in the world. It's a big goal though. No.